So uh, thank you again, Emily. Thank you, Casey. Thank you, Keith. Uh, yeah, thank you again for that. Um, we are now going to take questions, I guess. Does anybody? Um, yeah, I have a question. Raise your hand. Oh, okay. yes. <laughs> yeah. Yes, hi. I have a couple of questions. You did not mention whatsoever disabled drivers, elderly drivers, yeah. or emergency vehicle access in any of this, as well as the traffic flow. Several years ago, the median was enlarged on our block, and we were assured it will not affect anything. We are uh, Eastern Parkway between Washington and Plaza. Mm -hmm. And when the median was marked, we were told nothing will change, the traffic flow will be the same. The median was enlarged larger than we were told. And on our block, a truck cannot pass a car. A car cannot pass a truck. It's been years now of honking horns, which never occurred before. So those are just some of the issues that many of my neighbors and I Four generations have, of family traditions. as well as the question is the disabled, elderly, and emergency services. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much for those very important concerns. Um, so a huge part of this effort is traffic analysis. And so as we come to the community, we'll be sharing details of that larger traffic model and be able to talk about some of the pros and cons. It's important for us to understand not just a benefit on a, a single block or um, you know, a, a single corridor, but really understand the larger network. Um, that's some analysis that we've already done for some of the individual open street corridors, but this will really allow us um, to look at the larger network. So we'll be sharing um, those details for folks to better understand and weigh in on. Um, foundational to all of DOT's work is making sure um, that the emergency services can continue to um, meet uh, the needs both kind of on individual blocks, but also as they pass through the neighborhood. Um, so those, coordinate regularly with the fire department, um, talk to local precincts. Um, they will continue to be a big part of this design process and we consider um, those, those agencies a kind of key stakeholder uh, in, in the design of our streets. Um, it's also very important um, to uh, consider all, I mean, as Casey mentioned, seniors are um, you know, a, a, big, um, a big stakeholder here and in this neighborhood, but particularly accessibility um, is a big thing that we actually think we can achieve uh, in a better way through a capital project. So the tools we have to make um, our, our street designs accessible are, um, are we have more options with, with the capital project, so that will also be kind of another key piece of, of design. Um, and at DOT, we have an accessibility coordinator um, who we work with very closely, um, and he'll be part of, of this next set of um, engagement as well. Let me just, uh, if I can't ask the next question, what do you guys want? You've got almost 200 people in this room right now. Yeah. What do you want from us tonight, basically? What are you looking for to get from the people in this room? So I think if folks have suggestions about specific uh, stakeholders, if you have suggestions about format, I mean, honestly, we are looking to try to reach as many people as possible to be able to get um, specific feedback um, when we start to show concepts. So, um, you know, any, any feedback, you know, if you've engaged with, um, with our process in the past, what worked, what didn't work, um, who are your maybe neighbors or stakeholders who um, didn't feel like they were included in the process and, and how we can include them. I think those suggestions are always very, very helpful. I don't know, Keith or Casey, if you have additional thoughts. So, I will also flag so, that um, we are working really closely uh, with Grow NYC and the Green Market as well. Um, they're, you know, they're a big operational stakeholder in Grand Army Plaza. Hi, um, good evening. I live on uh, St. John's, on the corner of St. John's and Underhill. And I was wondering, 
I understand that you did the survey in the middle of the pandemic when people were hovering, so I feel that I'm very involved. I'm a journalist. I never heard about this, so I did participate in it. And I was wondering what, um, based on what happened with Underhill, that you felt that you needed to turn it into a bike corridor when the park is one one block away. Um, I don't I don't recall since I've been in the neighborhood. I've owned my co-op since 2000. I don't recall having accidents along Underhill for you to get rid of all these parking spaces. And I think. That's spaces is a form of gentrification because you're not considering the, the fresh direct driver who drives to the factory, you're not considering the UPS driver who drives to Queens and has to come back at home and park, you're not considering elderly people who are not taking city bikes or who are not paying the exorbitant fees for Uber, and I feel that, you know, under you know, it ain't broke, don't fix it. Yeah. It's me! No. Mm -hmm. Yo. Uh -oh. One thing I would like, because this is a meeting, I kind of joked, a meeting about meetings, because it's about the next steps of community engagement. Pro, con, somewhere lukewarm and ambivalent. I really don't want hooting and hollering. Um, gentle, polite applause is fine. But let's try not to shout down anyone. If you support someone. How gentrified of you. Right. <laughs> Wait, you in a, in a neighborhood in of color. You in a neighborhood of color. Oh, now we got to be white. Okay, we hear you. Thank you. You've been hurt. You've been hurt. Yo, yo, yo. Hey, look, yo, can I, I agree take... with you? All right. I'm Good. trying to make sure that everyone is hurt. And, we're, and we have to be out of here by 8. Oh. So I would like very much. Can I take a question? Can I get? Can I get? Can I, get, can I go here, sir? 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 Can I go? Yeah, yeah. I agree with what this lady said. What's going on at Grand Army Plaza? Ain't broke. It really isn't. You have to protect it. <laughs> oh, you have the roots and hollows. Yes, you yeah. see? Oh, oh, no, no, no. Well, stand up. Maybe you can hear me a little bit better. The fact is that we have protected bike lanes, we have protected bike systems, and if and I'm the one that I'm a race walker, I'm also a driver. And if you obey those systems, if you use these safety uh, systems that are already there, there's no safety issue. But very often, especially cyclists, don't. Mm -hmm. I come close to hitting a couple every time I use my car. They, have they drive around. They, they the go around at night with no lights, completely oblivious to traffic signals. So we already have a situation that's perfectly safe for pedestrians and uh, bike riders in the in Grand Army Plaza. It seems that these plans are just going to cause a lot more traffic on side streets. Yes. Yeah. They're going to impair access. Not just for people who are disabled, not just for people of color, but for regular human beings. Oh, they really? Want to go people away. of color are not regular human no, 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 beings. No, 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 it's no, no, for regular human beings. For everyone. For everyone. For everyone. Let's move on. 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 let you have the right to have access to the road and the street system. Yo. I also want to know what you mean by your bus program. Yo. Yes. 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 What is that? Yes. Yo, sir. Sir. Hey. Sir. Sir. Can you guys go? Where? Where? Over here? If you are unable to let me know. Can I go? Because I was here before. What the? Like, can I go here? Yeah, thank you. This is crazy. Yeah. I don't care. It's a free country. It's a free country. It's a free country. Free country. Get out of here. Free. Free country. Free country. Got you. Free country. My only concern with turning that whole area into green space is really when an emergency vehicle needs to get over from the far right side of that picture to the left side, they are cutting through that cement area to serve those people in need. And as we've seen, there's been increased rainfall, flooding, those emergency services have to serve those people. So that's my only concern with some of the pictures that have been shown in this presentation because the, some of the traffic flow in previous slides have not addressed emergency vehicles, maybe needing to go backwards to serve those people in the community. Thank you. Uh, we're also going to 
Just for, we've got about 30, 40 people lined up, so Damn, a minute and a half time-wise. Yeah. Do you want to answer that while we go from there? I would say that uh, as, as part of our outreach, uh, we said earlier that we are going to be talking to emergency services about it, so there'll be fire, the police department, sanitation, all of them we're going to be talking to about this, so they're part of the conversation. And also, as we continue our outreach, as we talked about before, that's the kind of feedback we're looking for, and the other comments for that as well, so. That's helpful and valuable for us. And again, just want to emphasize, there are no set plans here. So use an illustrative concept. And this is a study that is going to look at possible future options. So just to be clear where we are. Next question. Um, can you speak a bit more about your plans for enforcement? Um, I see a lot of new rules and ideas, um, but I also see a lot of examples where there are existing rules and ideas that are simply not enforced um, with any regularity. And so I'm concerned about Maybe introducing something else that is not enforceable. So if you could speak a bit more about your plans to increase enforcement of either the rules that exist now or your next plan. Sure, thanks. Um, so definitely enforcement is a huge component to how we think about design, um, particularly with our Open Street program, um, which uh, is now permanent and has rules. Um, that's something that we coordinate with our colleagues at NYPD, Department of Sanitation, and others on a regular basis um, to talk about you know, issues that we're seeing. Um, for us and a lot of these projects, a lot of the um, kind of communication starts by education, especially when um, they're, new, they're new projects. We want to make sure folks understand uh, the rules and regulation and go from there, but um, de definitely something we think a lot about um, and coordinate with, with our other agency colleagues. We're just going to go back and forth. Cool. Uh, my question is, could, with a number of pilots already in place uh, with pedestrian uh, streets and bicycle streets, can, can you talk to hmm? us a little bit about how you're going to, hmm? or are you, you know incorporating like, business to, yeah, uh, success? Yeah. Specifics, you, you like shopping statistics, no. and stuff like that, to like, discussion? Yeah. Yeah, thanks for that. So we have um, done a series of economic studies, both for plazas, but also for open streets. Uh, and we will continue as part of this effort to look at those indicators, but also um, do specific surveys and outreach to businesses to also understand what their needs are to kind of right size a lot of the curb management um, to be able to make sure that businesses can still thrive along the corridor. I understand this is a concept, but has anybody really given any thought about educating bikers on how to ride their bikes in the city. Mm -hmm. A lot of seniors in this city alone that are getting hit. Two of my neighbors got their arms broken because of bikes. I'm a biker and I am a driver. But the bikes that I see in the city, they're in front of buses. They're all over the place. They're weaving in and out of traffic. No and, and, with a, and with an open concept, I'm afraid that it's going to get even worse. So is the city putting any efforts behind public announcements, making sure that this doesn't really happen with this? Yeah, thank you. So um, a few things. I mean, one, we are happy and we can take this back and talk about kind of additional education campaigns, particularly with the fast evolving mobility and the different speeds of cyclists. Um, as well as mopeds, it's something we think a lot about. Um, part of some of our designs also incorporates slow speed for cyclists as well. So part of how um, you know we're thinking about uh, Underhill Avenue, for example, is that it's like overall calming both for vehicles and for cyclists. Um, but definitely an important um, you know an important point of feedback, and we can continue to um, to do education around that. Uh, so I, I have an opinion, but I'll defer to ask a process question because I think everyone here probably has an opinion, but we all came here because we all love our neighborhood. Mm -hmm. We all want it to be the best neighborhood yep. possible. And I think folks yep. are yelling, they're upset because they don't feel like their opinion has been heard. And I know you all do these meetings. I know you also have your own expert opinion and knowledge that we don't have. But what's the plan to make people feel comfortable once you decide what it is? How are we going to know that, like, that's the opinion that's worked best for the majority of people. 
So that's a, a really great question. Um, it's not so easy to answer because we really do shape our process and designs around engagement. Um, so oftentimes when you know we're hearing from people that um, they're not quite coming to a, a consensus, you know, we'll work to either develop different designs ideas that we can take back. Um, or we'll do additional engagement and feedback. Um, we will um, make sure, again, that as much of the comments and the survey results um, that we collect, that we share with, with um, the public, um, we try to do things as well where we're collecting addresses and zip codes so people can also have a sense and understand who's saying what and you know where they live. Are they a visitor to the neighborhood versus do they live in the neighborhood versus if they're a business in the neighborhood just to you know better better understand. Um, so again I think we don't we don't have like a clear um, you know a clear answer for that today, but we're hoping that um, you know we'll really work with all of you to build consensus over the next uh, many months and through um, the year in this process. Um, I think like like Keith and Casey said, also this is not um, this is not a fast process. It's not like we're going to get all of this feedback and then implement something tomorrow. So I think um, you know that that's also something to take into account that the neighborhood will continue to um, evolve. And so it's just important for us that as we're taking any step forward in this project, that we're always reconnecting and, and hearing from. The community and getting a pulse on kind of what the, the current issues are. Yeah. I also want to add that part of the answer to that question is going to be hearing from you what kind of outreach is, uh, is viable and credible. And so we've tried a lot of outreach rep methods, some community boards, some big companies like this. We've done door to door, we've done, but they don't door to door. So we've done surveys, we've done a lot of these things, phone surveys, all these things. So I think part of this process is getting credibility about what we're doing and the iteration of talking to everyone here and other stakeholders. So again, the gap in this area, there's people here, but the gap has a large influence. So like, we're the laws of Brooklyn, not just here. So we're going to try to get a wide variety of viewpoints of what people think about the future here. And that's going to sort of guide what we're thinking this consensus is going to be. And it's not going to be something that's very quick or fast, clearly. Hello, my name is Christopher Leon Johnson. At, on the record, I used to be a member of Community Board 8. I used to be a former member from 2023 to 2023. Now, this is what I want to ask you, uh, the DOT, with the in-person workshops. Who will be hosting these workshops? Will it be the people, like the New York City DOT, and the Community Board 8, Community Board 6, and Community Board 9? Or will it be this organization right here on my shirt, which everybody knows here is a corrupt organization, called Transportation Alternatives? Will they be hosting these workshops for in-person workshops instead of DOT. Because we see what's going on here is that we have organizations like Transportation Alternative, which is a corrupt organization, and nothing bullet for, for them but lobbyists, bullying, bully lobbyists, like the people, like this person in the back wearing the pink hat. Um, they are hold, they are hold, um, taking over the DOT. They own the DOT. And I want to know, will the DOT start hosting these workshops independently on the DOT? I don't, you can bring the elected officials all you want. But they shouldn't be having transportation alternatives hosting these workshops and being the de facto voice for community engagement. Because what I'm seeing what's going on here is that all we see here is nothing but TA lobbyists and TA consultants running over these boards, running over these meetings like this one here. This is rigged. You guys are not, I know it's not nothing as you guys, but it's, it's about Yandis. Yandis is captive to Transo. Yandis is captive to open plants. He's captive to Streets Block. He's captive to Mark Gordon, who owns all these organizations and who owns the DOT. Now, this is my thing. I know I'm about to go right here. Uh, wait, I know. Yeah, wait, wait. Before I go, wait, before I go, sir. Wait, 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 wait. Before I, wait, before I, wait, wait. Yeah, the question is, wait, wait. The qu yeah, the question is, wait, before we end here, I hope that you community board members, do the, community board chairs do the right thing. Stop be Don't be captive to transportation alternatives and all these organizations. Make sure you do the right thing for the people. Make sure you do the right thing for the people here, not just for the lobbyists and organizations that y'all trying to get political pull with. Thank you. Thank you. What I would say is that it will be a public process yep. uh, led by DOT and others. And um, whether it's uh, bigger meetings like this or smaller, all of that will be determined. But DOT with our consultants will be determining and also feedback from you determine how we're going to do outreach to this process. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead. Hi. Um, so I live on the Street. So yeah, I really no appreciate hearing Thank you, you talk about uh, pedestrian improvements at Grand Army. You know, 
a feeling you know, like people really come speeding down Eastern Parkway when I'm trying to cross, same with Lockbush. Um, so, you know, anything to make the test reading safer, I appreciate. Um, my question is kind of about the um, traffic study process. Um, what sort of, um, I guess, like metrics are you tracking in your model? Um, and like, how will the model kind of account for the changes, you know, starting presumably this June in one word um, in terms of travel reductions to and from Manhattan? I can take that one. Um, so in regards to the traffic model, a lot of things we look at are pedestrian and vehicle mm -hmm. conflicts. So even just looking at the number of crosswalks vehicles are turning through is something we look at to increase pedestrian safety. Uh, we do look at what's called level of service or delay for vehicles. That is something we take into consideration mostly because we don't want to be impacting traffic signals or backing up traffic to adjacent traffic signals. Uh, we also will be trying to do um, vehicle miles traveled. Uh, so really looking at who's traveling in the neighborhood and are we increasing the amount of distance people are traveling or reducing it. Um, and then in regards to what's happening in June with congestion pricing, we are taking a conservative approach um, that no traffic reduction will happen in this section of Brooklyn because we are so far from the, from the zone um, as a worst case scenario, but we can always update that once it goes into effect because um, this far out it's not known what those impacts will be. Hi, um, I have feedback and a question. Um, this piece of feedback is regarding your question on which method to use to solicit feedback from the community. I do think you need to find a way to ensure that you're actually getting feedback from community members because there's been a number of surveys that you're soliciting input online and it's coming from people who live in Manhattan, not people who actually live in this community which skews the outcome so people who are actually directly impacted by these decisions are not being solicited properly. And then the um, question is to what extent there is going to be any form of disparate impact analysis, particularly on minority and women-owned businesses in the area, because I know when um, the open streets on Vanderbilt happened, there is a lot of um, sort of misinformation suggesting that all businesses were positively impacted when that's not the case. In fact, long-term minority businesses mean that it has been negatively impacted, and it's been unclear to me as a community member how that how metrics are being collected and also shared given the skew between reality and then what's posted. So thank you. I mean, we um, pretty clearly include um, our methodology for um, like our economic analysis and things like that. So happy to talk that through. Um, also hope that uh, the message is clear that it's um, uh, the economic report is some. It doesn't um, explicitly say all. And I think it's a really it's an incredibly important point. Um, and, and one we will, um, we, can, we'll, we can think about how we might be able to kind of account for um, that data point moving forward. Thanks. Um, so I'm gonna share some, some feedback and uh, some facts and then also follow up with two uh, pretty straightforward questions. Um, uh, first, you know, our, uh, I'm a public member of the Community Board 8 Transportation Committee, and I, I just want to be really clear about this to folks in the room. You know, our community district is 70% car free, but 70% of households are car free. Yeah. 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 Thank you. Um, and the, the, the injuries, the fatalities citywide, um, if you're looking at if you're looking at um, cyclists compared to, to motor vehicles, um, the, the vast, vast majority, greater than 98% of the fatalities every year are a result of a motor vehicle crash. Um, and as someone who you know, has a close family member who was almost killed by a, a you know, car crash, I, I really would like to see um, solutions that uh, you know, address that 98%. That um, and you know, for me, that means uh, 
uh, taking the most aggressive approach to, to pedestrianizing these spaces so that the, the millions of people who use the park every year can, can, can do so safely. Um, and then two questions I have, which are, um, after designs are uh, established, is there any possibility that there'll be implementation happening under a SIP? And then two, does, uh, does DOT ever make changes to the streetscape without asking uh, emergency services, FDNY, et cetera? So I think um, DOT has had uh, many successes kind of iterating our, our street design with our light touch paint and gravel. So I think that will be part of the conversation and something we'll be asking all of you and, and the larger public about are there continuously things that we can iterate to try to um, to try to evolve these these corridors moving forward. Um, so part of um, the conversation and then um, we have engineers that sign off on every single one of our street designs throughout the city and their uh, license is online is on the line when they approve and sign and mark drawings and all of those drawings and all of those designs um, are to standards and um, you know specific review and, and conversations with um, our, our emergency service colleagues, as well as you know, a whole host of other different rules and you know, size of uh, trucks and things like that that are allowed in the city of New York. Um, so that's uh, part of um, foundationally how we design our streets at DOT. Thank you very much. Uh, I similarly am going to both comment and ask a question. I think that'll probably be the trend going forward. Um, I'm gonna try to focus on people with disabilities uh, in my comments. Um, I think there's been a lot of focus on drivers with disabilities, but I think pedestrians with disabilities should also be considered. And I think that one really key area that you already mentioned that like that would be very important to that is race crosswalks. I think that's a huge slam dunk because mm -hmm. A, it slows down the drivers and makes it so that it's safer generally for pedestrians, but B, makes it so that a person with a disability doesn't have to go down a ramp into the sidewalk, one that can often be damaged um, and also very hard to undo, or get into the crosswalk rather than the sidewalk. Um, the second focus on people with disabilities I wanna talk about is that Grand Army Plaza. I know that one of the people said that it is already inevitable to cross. Um, I don't think that's true for all people with disabilities. My brother is legally blind and I think it would be a nightmare for him to cross uh, Grand Army Plaza and navigate it. There, it's a nightmare for people with that. Um, in terms of questions, uh, one thing that I didn't hear brought up was daylighting. Um, I think in particular on Vanderbilt, um, we have a win in both directions here. If we use daylighting in order to have mopeds lo loading them, essentially, so you let mopeds park their bikes like where it would be daylighting, it still increases the visibility for pedestrians to cross, and it also helps get mopeds off the sidewalks, which I think is an issue for everyone in this room. So I think that would be a great way to try to like have a win-win situation here. Thank you very much. Sunday at Lovely, they're closed every other day. 
<laughs> we are aware of this issue. We uh, it might be about it, the North Flatbush bid, and the neighbors. So we do know about this. We actually uh, spoke to uh, Chick fil A themselves about this issue. Um, and part of it is uh, the complication there is that the deliveries are done not by them, it's done by the companies, and they're not as always uh, as cooperative, I should say, as uh, the rest of us. So we are aware of the problem, we look into it. It is something that seems to be, particularly with Chick fil A, it's not just that location, a couple of locations in Manhattan and other places that have the same issue. So something about Chick fil A, but yes, we are aware of the problem. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, in full disclosure, I'm Regina Cahill. I'm the chair of the North Lifers Business and Business District. Yeah. We're well aware of it. Like <laughs> Cook at home. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want to challenge a little bit of your methodology because if we go at the 50,000 foot view of Grand Army Plaza, it's a wheel with a hub. You're only addressing it, Vanderbilt and Underhill. Those of us who've lived on Flatbush Avenue for 49 years know that this is a balloon. You squeeze one area and pass the other. Why not go back to the table and look at 50,000 feet? You know, because this, you can't just fix one part. Those of us who've lived with open streets on Vanderbilt and, and now the Underhill closer, it gets pushed onto Flatbush Avenue. There are people that live there who deserve to have the same peace and comfort. So I would say, Go back to 50,000 square feet. Thank you. Yes. Just to that point, so while these are the locations that are being studied for like more intensive designs, we are doing a more extensive traffic model that includes Washington, Carlton, and 6th Avenue and Flatbush Avenue. So it's, it is a broader view. But there's the other um, side still. There's still the whole hub has to be looked at. Uh, so we are taking a more comprehensive view, but if you do have specific feedback on exactly what score are we studying, you can take that. Lobbyists. There's a lobbyist right there. That's a lobbyist. Hi. Um, my name is Linda, and I'm a member of United Neighbors of Prospect and Today. Um, Commissioner Gray is very well aware of us. Uh, one thing that we have been advocating for is multi-language outreach. We find that all of these outreach surveys, presentations are done in English only, and we are a multicultural community. So we, I think I did see a survey that was done in multiple languages recently, so thank you for that. But when you're looking at your process moving forward, can you find ways to include uh, members of the community that work and live here that do not speak English. The other thing I want to bring up is that there is a world-class hospital and cancer treatment center on 6th Street and 7th Avenue. And if you close off the uh, part of Grand Army Plaza and make people go just a little bit out of their way, if you're getting chemotherapy, if you're coming home from surgery, going a little bit out of your way every day is not fun. Um, the other thing I want to bring up is that we did talk to our local first responders. We talked to both precincts. We talked to both firehouses. We didn't have a firefighter come. Uh, Witherwax, Alex was there at the EST meeting. He was there. And he did tell us that the community is not aware of how much trouble these programs and redesigns are causing them to do their job. So we would like more input from our local uh, first responders who actually have to drive on these streets. There will be more language access moving forward. Thank you for that suggestion. We have done that for various projects in DOT, multiple languages, and we'll do it here. Um, here, your point that kind of feedback from the cancer centers, exactly the kind of feedback we like to hear, but also at the same time, some of our traffic models are going to try to take into account what the impact might be, depending on what options we hear in the consensus thoughts. And, uh, and lastly, yes. We, again, we coordinate with all the first response uh, agencies, as we said. We will obviously talk more with the local people as part of the local precincts and firehouses. We talk about this. We have talked to the borough commands of all of them and make sure that there's going to be one message from all of them moving forward. And I think they're clear on that, too. So thank you. Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Kathy. I'm a mom. I'm a Park Slope resident. Lobbyist. And a lobbyist. Right. And a lobbyist. No, it's a lobbyist. Oh, a lobbyist. Thanks for that, Um Hi, 
everyone. I'm Kathy. I'm a Park Slope resident. I'm a mom. I bike with my kid. Work for TA. I experience the street like the vast majority of us by walking, biking, and using public transit. Um, Alex said earlier in his testimony um, that 70% of us in this area do not own cars. Meanwhile, 75% of the street is dedicated to the storage and movement of vehicles. We are asking for a transformation of that and rebalancing of that. Not to um, eliminate cars completely, but to say, let's rebalance and address the streets, design the streets and to prioritize pedestrians, cyclists, and public transit. 3,000 3,100 people have signed our petition for a state for Grand Army that does just that. Um, you can Google, I'll have to our sheets, but um, I, my question for, well, I guess, you know, Chris mentioned that we, I own DOT. You do, you do own the DOT. You're a lobbyist, you're for Transult. You work for Transult. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Question the agenda. Like, we're going to increase public space. It might make people travel a little farther. Is that something you're on board with or not? Um, we might shorten travel times, um, but you might have to wait at the signal a little longer. Is that something you want to see? So it's all about having conversations and being able to compare different scenarios uh, to each other. Um, and we are going to be taking safety into, into consideration. So we take safety into consideration for all of our projects under Vision Zero. Um, so we will be looking at which um, locations within Grand Army Plaza have the highest rate of pedestrian injuries, what are the causes of these crashes, uh, to try to mitigate them through design uh, inter interventions. Uh, and that will apply to all three locations uh, for the study. And to reiterate, a study... Yeah, yeah you work for trans, 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 trans all. You know what I mean? Stop playing around. Like, you're on the clock with this. Yeah, back again, bro. Else. Uh, a couple very quick questions. I'll give you all the questions and you decide how many if you want to answer them. Uh, one, what other neighborhoods in the metropolitan area in the five boroughs are um, the subject of this sort of initiative? Okay, other than you know, the Herald Square or Times Square. Okay. Uh, secondly, uh, is the 
designed models, that of the vision zero from the feds, where you're using that and you're just kind of adapting it. And to that end, will there be an EIS or are we going to ex expect a, um, a no uh, significant impact finding? Yeah. You know, off, off the top. And uh, the other thing is, I know that, we all know that surveys and statistics like history belong to those who write them, you know, and who collect them. So we would ask you to maybe make that survey a little worded a little bit more objectively, you know, when when it gets distributed. Because right now it's like, when did you stop beating your wife? You know, that, that kind of thing. And um, okay, last thing is I'm associated with an organization of between six and seven hundred older people who live in Park Slope, you know, and the area. One of our projects has been safe sidewalks, you know, for uh, older people, the frail, and the disabled. We walked all 150 streets and made a survey of uh, damages. We've been in contact with the deliveristas and several other organizations, as well as the police and the hospital, to get an idea of how many people have been injured, as well as DOT and our local politicians. And frankly, we're hearing there's no money. There's nothing we can do. So I would reach out to you and ask you to sort of incorporate sidewalks and the condition of the sidewalks, you know, into, into your studies. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah, that was a lot. So maybe we can each um, take a turn. No, thank you. But all, all excellent questions. Yeah. Um, so your question about um, analysis and if you would do an EIS and things like that, um, the uh, any kind of analysis would actually be related to when we actually have a scenario that we'd like to move forward with. Um, so depending on, you know, as Casey showed, there's a scenario that we're looking at that kind of keeps Grand Army Plaza as is. That's not something that would need um, an EIS or you know more more detailed traffic analysis. So um, that that's something you know we'll cater towards the. But depending on the depending on the proposal, we would um, you know do all kind of appropriate um, analysis and determination of impact. Um, you also asked a question about where else are we doing this type of thing. Um, CPSD is a fairly competitive citywide process, so um, we don't do um, a lot of them as a city. So one of the last uh, CPSD studies um, that our team did specifically was actually in the Flatiron District um, as part of our work uh, along the Broadway corridor. Um, but we also do kind of larger scale uh, analysis and, and looking at um, larger scale projects and, and neighborhood uh, development. Um, and so that's kind of happening in an ongoing way. And we have quite a few corridors um, throughout the city. Uh, 34th Avenue in Jackson Heights is a project that has capital funding and will be doing uh, and undergoing uh, a large community engagement process related to that capital project um, and other kind of uh, larger transportation um, plans in the neighborhood. Uh, it, 34th Avenue is an open street that we evolved um, and has a, it's a real funded project. Yes. <clears throat> Good evening. I'm Mike Jones, president of St. John's Block Association. It's in Washington under the It's my 20th year. I just turned 50 years old this year. And I'm saying this to say this. <laughs> PS9, I went to school on the hill when I, that was 45 years ago. <clears throat> we never had problems on the hill. So I'm really gonna, I'm gonna try to hit on the hill as quick in 90 seconds to be respectful of everybody's time. And I'm gonna try to keep my tone so you don't think that I'm being very vocal, but I'm very passionate about my neighborhood that I grew up in. And the individuals that are not here that did not know about meetings like this or are not internet savvy or cannot make it physically to make these meetings. So that's my voice for them, if you understand what I'm saying. So Underhill is definitely, and it's me and the other 1,500 to 2,000 people who signed signatures, 
Underhill is horrible to the neighborhood. Mm -hmm. should, it needs to go back to where it was if you're gonna, because, <laughs> thank you. Only, and I'm saying this not as a personal, like this is my personal advice, I'm saying this for the fact that if you have a two-way street going from Eastern Park, this is a small corridor, and that's the reason why I think it got seized and sabotaged, because nobody was paying attention to nope. it, and those that did in 2020, when they started that with the closing streets because of COVID, mm -hmm. it was able to get taken over because nobody noticed. And there's a Boulder DOT we know that works with the organization who does work with the open streets. And trans all. Trans all. Trans all. Transportation alternatives. What I'm saying is, there's not enough. The outreach that you're saying that's happening is evidently not happening. It's not because. There are people that's, that, uh, you can see the spaces, and it's not less, it's only about, I count it, it's 20 people that look like me. Are you saying there's no 20 people that look like me in these neighborhoods? That's not so. And that's the sad part. And that's what brings tears to my eyes, because these minority businesses that are on Vanderbilt, on the hill again, hurt. But it's really the residents that we made this this area the way it is before gentrification, before what's happening. And this is the reason why we got trees that we planted when I was a little kid and things of that nature. And I can go on and on, but I'm just saying this. Those who don't know, because I know some of you guys don't know. And we're not saying we're against bikers and we need more cars. It needs to be a balance. That's what, and it's not a balance. You can't say, listen, okay, bikers, you know, the accent, we understand that. That underhill could be a safer guard if you put of course, if you, uh, you don't have to make a one way, this way, that way. PS9 is being harmed. All the residents are harmed from Underhill. And I think Atlantic Avenue, because you did not mention Washington Avenue once, and Washington Avenue residents are hurting in the west of, I'll say, east of Crown Heights because of Underhill being closed, because the 45 now takes a half an hour. Before. To Mr. Jones, uh, thank you. We had a, a couple of conversations ourselves. I appreciate your feedback. And one of the things that we've learned is that, yes, there, that's one of the reasons why we're having a meeting like this tonight, because of people that felt like they weren't heard before, and that's why we're trying to see if we, we do a better job at that, and that's one of the things that we're pledging to do in this process. So appreciate your perspective, Mr. Jones. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> uh, first of all, I hate speaking in public, so it took a lot to get me up here. Uh, first and foremost, I am a big fan of the Underhill project so far, and I think the raised cross, crosswalks will be sort of a, a welcome addition to the whole project. Uh, I've lived on Underhill for 20 years. I mean, a noob. Um, and um, one of the other things, uh, question is stats for Underhill. Since it's been implemented in terms of crashes, that's the net. net. Uh, does anybody have that at their Disposal. Um, yeah, yeah, before and after, because my daughter was almost killed on Underhill because we were going to go all anecdotal, but that's a whole other story for another day. Um, the other thing is that um, the Underhill Green Market has spawned a number of great vendors, you know, people really getting themselves together, but it is causing a pedestrian issue, and I think with the redesign, uh, hopefully that's going to be accommodated. You know, the, you have the green market vendors, and you also have satellite vendors. Um, yeah, Grand Army Plaza, not Underhill. Um, but yeah, sorry. Um, but I noticed that on weekends that vendors are left, right, and center because they're places to make money. And uh, I think it's great. But it's not really planned. And I think it should be accommodated in the, in the future. And the last thing is loading zones. Um, I assume that's going to be part of the end of the yeah, absolutely. So we don't have enough um, after data for Underhill yet, but I think we've heard a couple of people, um, you know, make strong comments about wanting to better understand the safety stats uh, for these projects along the corridor for all users. Um, so that will be information that we'll be bringing um, in greater detail at the community engagement sessions. Um, thanks for your point about the um, the vendors. Um, we'll take that into consideration um, and your third point loading zone so loading zones were very much part of our um, implementation of Vanderbilt and some of the bike corrals and neckdowns and other um, pedestrian priority uh, efforts and that will continue to be a tool that we think about um, as we as we think about the larger neighborhood
<laughs> Hello everyone, my name is Devon. I'm 21 years old and I've lived in this neighborhood for 21 years. <laughs> um, so I just made a few bullet points here. They're all over the place. But starting with the build out of Grand Army. So where is the B-69 going to turn off if that gets filled out? And also, with the B-69, Vanderbilt Avenue, if that's turned into a permanent open street, um, where is that bus going to get rerouted? As an organization that says that they're accessible, doing these changes is not very accessible to elderly and disabled people. And, the, yeah, and in the summertime, when it is closed, I don't know where the B69 alternative stops are, so I had to walk all the way past Atlantic Avenue, whatever stop that is after Atlantic Avenue. Fulton. I, Fulton. I, I'm young, so I can do that, but my grandmother, she's like 80 years old. Is she really gonna walk all the way down here to take the bus? Um, my next point here, the bus priority thing on Flatbush Avenue. So if, if that's made a bus priority, right, and Vanderbilt is closed and Underhill is closed, I live on St. John's, where am I gonna turn off to come home? That's ridiculous to go all the way to Washington um, after class and to come home, that's ridiculous. I know our city is very transit accessible, but it's a myth that you don't need a car to live here. Uh, one more quick, I'm sorry. <laughs> Yes. Uh, I think we all, I think we also met uh, that day I was on Federal Avenue when we were doing door to door uh, cycling. So as far as Flatbush Avenue bus priority is concerned, um, that's a project that again is going to take a lot of community discussion and it's nothing. There's no set plans yet, so nothing is certain, and we have to talk to the community about that. So there's nothing more to say about that until we get there. And as far as um, the, the bus, the 69 bus, 69 bus. 69. how would it work? Right, right, I'm sorry. So that would be covered, uh, again, no set plans, there's no one, again, reiterating that point. Um, but depending on what happens, we will obviously talk to our partners in New York City Transit about that, about how the bus routes would work, and where the stops would be, that will all be a part of the conversation, part of the traffic that we were talking about. But again, nothing set yet. We know I just wanted to know how is bias going to be excluded in the survey sample? Yeah. I'm an accounting major and a part of accounting, I have to take economic courses. And I'm in economic statistics right now, and we're talking about survey sampling. So I just wanted to know what measures are you guys taking because voluntary response sampling, which you guys have been doing, that has a lot of bias on both sides. So excluding that as much as possible, what are some steps that you guys are doing? Good question. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, so in addition to trying to make these meetings and outreach more accessible, have you considered uh, having these meetings at different times, because the majority of these community outreach meetings I've found happen on the same weeknight every week, which is assuming that people are working a traditional nine to five schedule, which is not true for very many members of the community. So if you want to reach everyone from the community, having them at different times on different days, having little flexibility. And my second question is, have you considered and is there a plan to segregate, segregate pedestrians and cyclists because while both should have access to the road, the overflow that happens into bike lanes um, becomes dangerous for cyclists and pedestrians. And going back to loading zones, what are the considerations being taken so there is access to the curb where a bike lane doesn't become a parking space for delivery or people who have accessibility issues or those sorts of things, which pushes bikes into those people and then into traffic, which is unsafe for everyone. Thanks. So regarding the times of workshops, um, we do try to have a wide gradient. So we do evenings, we can do lunchtime, 
virtual, which is great because people who are in the office can um, take a lunch break. We do on the street, so we have tried to um, have setups that are right um, as school is letting out so we can catch uh, caretakers, and we've also done the weekend. So if there are other time frames um, that people feel like they, you know, it's a good access point, please let us know. The other key part of our whole survey model is that folks can review the board, they can get a link to the survey, they can review our materials on their own and make comments on their own time, uh, regardless of uh, when we're actually out being able to talk people through the proposals. Um, I also wanna say that one of the goals with these workshops is while we are going to have um, workshop specific days for each of these areas because we know people have focused uh, comments. Uh, we will also have staff and materials so people can talk about the other areas as well. So while we will have focused workshop days, we'll also be able to um, you know, capture feedback from folks about the wider area um, should that be the time that you're available. Um, somebody, oh, yeah. And in regards to loading zones, uh, that's something that we would look at as, as curb usage. That's really where a lot of that's going to determine. That's going to determine what our decision may be on that. But, uh, yeah, and that reminds me, your other question about um, segregating uh, cyclists and pedestrians. Um, as Casey described, we're really going to look at a gradient. So we'll look at some options that kind of clearly define the space between the two modes, as well as start to look at uh, design options where the two are more mixed and merging. Following an earlier comment on um, enforcement and people not really being able to trust that uh, laws are being enforced on bicycles, I also feel the same way about cars increasingly in the city. And um, I appreciate the parts of this that uh, will control traffic by design as opposed to by, uh, or maybe in addition to by enforcement. Um, so I, I appreciate um, a lot of the elements that are going into that. Um, and uh, a question would be, um, I know in other, other cities, uh, maybe there are places in, in New York City, um, people have combined the use of, of uh, certain kinds of like bicycle lanes with emergency services. Um, so one instance that I know of is Valencia Street in San Francisco, there's a double wide um, bicycle lane going in two directions, and that's a lane that's accessible to, uh, to emergency vehicles um, during times when um, like the streets are completely clogged. I've seen so many ambulances that are just behind masses of vehicular traffic. Um, so I'm wondering if there's a potential win-win of design available here and if that's a consideration. Thanks. Thanks for that. That's definitely a consideration. A local example is the 14th Street busway in Manhattan. Um, we found that emergency services have really been able to use that as an emergency express corridor because of the lack of vehicular congestion. Hi, um, my name is Peter. I'm a, I'm a resident of Dean Street. I'm the director of Vanderbilt, and I'm also a public member of the ESC Committee at Committee Board 8, which is a meeting that takes place the last Tuesday of every month and is open to the public, and I really encourage everyone to, to come. Um, you'll find details on the Committee Board 8 website. Um, I have two questions. There, um, one, I want to just build on what some, a lot of the comments are about, you know, what you're looking at in terms of traffic impacts, and I think one of the, because I remember asking about this before, and it just seemed like when Under Hill was put in place, there wasn't there, there wasn't a specific study done for traffic, it was more of a kind of gleaning from existing data. I don't want to get bogged down to that point, but I think the real question is, uh, will you commit to the equivalent to the scoping? We, we, we can see what the what the proposals are. There's you know, three variations for each of these locations, so I think there's pretty much everybody in this room is capable of uh, figuring out what they would like to see you study, and that there would be like a dedicated meeting or a, a dedicated process to scoping um, before you announce the project proposals, because once the proposals are announced, people will be discouraged. And I think this way, because there are some pretty radical impacts, I would suspect um, you would want to actually have a the community would want to have faith that you would actually look at things properly, and this is an opportunity for you to increase transparency and, and, and input. I mean, one option is to use the community boards for a public process. Um, second, it would really be helpful if you would, it would be helpful if you would clarify the, the funding because $1.8 million of scoping is a huge, huge amount, as much, as much as many capital projects. And so you're presuming, I assume, that you're gonna have a lot of money in the future. So if you could define 
roughly how much money and what the specific sources are. That would be terrific. Thank you. So start and then maybe let PC dive into a little bit of the details, but I think exactly um, what you talked about where we were doing some more spot checks to understand uh, the different modes and traffic volumes um, in the area as part of um, our, our open street designs. This study funds a robust larger scale traffic study, which will get us to be able to really explain, as Casey said, the, the different trade-offs um, and what that means um, in, in many different ways. I think for us, we wanna iterate. We want to both show concepts and talk about what potential impacts would be. I think that helps people be able to give comments about what it would mean for them on the street. Um, we will be, um, as we have, Sorry. Um, as we have here, before we get to any final scope that we um, pitch for capital funding and actually reconstruction, um, we will be presenting to the community boards multiple times. So there will be many touch points with the community boards to be able to ask and really get into much, much greater detail. I was asking about the specifics, like a commitment to a specific scoping type um, process. Before you announce the proposals, I mean, that would put a lot of confidence to everybody here about your transparency and what you're looking at. If you can, well, to, to, the, to the point of the recommendation of the you post down a lot of them, what they want to have a touch on the board. So maybe she's the one to know when you're looking at the impact in a way that she, she should have the ability to tell you look at the impact before you put it in place. And you didn't actually specifically address the funding issue at all. Can you please explain where the funding and participation future and what is the source of funding? I mean, it must, must be coming from different places, I would assume. So, so the CPSD funds are expense dollars um, and as opposed to capital dollars um, and that city expense funding that OMB dedicates to this process. Again, that um, really allows us to go into a deep dive and study the different, uh, different options and be able to communicate and understand a set of impacts. So we're not just looking at traffic analysis, but as part of the process, we'll understand you know, what our um, colleagues at DEP, how this overlaps with their capital plan and any additional work or need that they have for water, sewer, infrastructure, things like that. Um, so again, the, the, the scope for the CPSD has been written and we are doing, we are engaged in that process now. Um, and then again, before we kind of finalize a capital scope, we'll have multiple touch points with the community board. Hi, um, I just want to kind of build off of a comment that was made with regard to like bottlenecking. I live on the corner of Plaza Street East and Flatbush Avenue, and it is it's a very dangerous intersection, and I find. It gets even worse during the summer when Vanderbilt gets closed because not only do you have pedestrian issues where there's an intersection right at Plaza, but also 8th Avenue, so two intersections in a very, very small area where you, I, I'm on Flatbush. I look at my window and on a daily almost see people get hit. It's kind of terrifying to walk through at times. And not only that, it's a little bit of a quality of life issue because you start having honking from 7 a.m. to about 8 to 9 p.m. 13 hours a day of honking is incessant, and something needs to be done. And my concern is, how do you move forward with whatever you do on Grand Army Plaza is going to just further negatively impact what's happening on Flatbush Avenue, because it, within the past year, it's gotten even worse. And I just can't see closing down Vanderbilt or some of the ways that you're talking about rerouting the traffic through the traffic circles. It just seems that all of that is just gonna have a negative blowback onto Flatbush Avenue. Sure, so I'll just say DOT has a lot of invisible tools that we use to um, be able to help mitigate some of these things. So everything from 
um, some pretty sophisticated uh, traffic signal timing and, and feathering and things that, that we do like that. I think another important um, piece to remember is that pedestrians can impact uh, traffic circulation. So by not allowing enough signal timing for pedestrian demand and pedestrian crossing, that also can really um, interrupt uh, a, a more fluid system. Um, so I think you are pointing out incredibly important pieces about um, you know, the need to understand any kind of positive uh, public space, public realm, pedestrian cyclist improvements with um, any potential impacts to the traffic network because it's also an incredibly important quality of life issue. So, I mean, that's that's really our goal, again, as Casey said, to be able to talk about the pros and cons and, and the benefits of, of each of the scenarios and, yeah, if there are trade-offs folks um, uh, want to take or not. So we're at 7.30. Uh, in the interest of time, I'm going to cut the questions down to a minute instead of 90 seconds, and that goes for the responses, too. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I live on Eastern Parkway, and it's gotten uh, on the sidewalk as well as the street, especially on the sidewalk, much, much busier, especially on the weekend. Sometimes it's very difficult to walk. Could you go back to the photograph of Grand Army Plaza and um, the park? It was a photograph, I think. Yeah. yeah so, that no, would no, be fine. You know that there's that weird triangle, you can't really see it there, where you have to stand between the library to get to the to get to the um, Grand Army Plaza park side. And it's it's it makes no sense. People on the weekend it's overflowing, there are bicycles, uh, people, uh, you know, baby carriages, everything. And then to go from there to the Grand Army Plaza side, there's not enough time. So what are you going to do about that weird little triangle where we feel trapped and traffic is going around? The other thing I would say is, I know you're doing all these studies and it's great. I walk and I bike. Either way I go, it just feels really dangerous. I would suggest somebody actually walking from Eastern Parkway on either side. If you go on the Grand Army Plaza side, you feel like you're crossing across a highway. If you go on the other side, you get trapped on that triangle and you're waiting there for a long time. It's better than it yeah, just to speak to your to your comment, I think that that traffic island is something that DOT hears about quite frequently uh, in the operations. I think that's a goal of the larger study of operations at Grand Army Plaza: is how could we change vehicular movements to potentially consolidate that crossing so you can cross it all in one time. So it's definitely something we're considering as part of this project. Sorry, you I'll cut it in out. No, six four. Wait, wait, wait. Um, so please. But no, if you could just go ahead and share it without a foil, that would be great. Thank you. 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 To you, thank you, 311. Oh my god, a minute. Come on. Okay. Oh, and also, we have a lot of business letters on uh, Vanderbilt yeah, that uh, have impact. Uh, so you can look at our website and uh, see those testimonials. Appreciate you. No problem, bro. Crowdsourcing sounds like a wonderful idea, and uh, I will say that as part of our outreach, uh, we're going to be talking to all the institutions along this area the Botanical Garden, Museum, Library. 
parts across the lines, et cetera, et cetera. So they'll all be a part of it. Any of their future plans and projects will be a part of that. Of course, the bid's involved. So it will all be a part of it. And will you share the data? Share the data. Share the data. This is a question about how rerouting traffic in Grand Army will affect streets to the west and south of Grand Army Plaza. A few months ago, there was public discussion of making Union Street one way going in. Uh, it's a mess because Hertz rental cars are parked in a no standing zone hours and days on end and are never ticketed. And then things were going to reroute the traffic going west down President Street. Is that still being proposed? If so, it is a disastrously bad idea. President Street is very narrow. If there are any delivery trucks, things back up, endless honking problems. And to compound what would make more traffic even worse is that PS321 is going to move pre-KK and first grade into the St. Francis School building that will be a major public school with lots of small kids and you don't want more traffic. It's not an active part of this study, though I will say that I disagree with your analysis on that uh, that change. And uh, we will, as part of the traffic uh, uh, study we're going to talk about all night, obviously all around um, the Grand Army Plaza and the other areas that we looked at, so obviously the union will probably be part of that. Hi. Um, I live off a very noisy Atlantic Avenue, uh, lots of honking good cars, so I enjoyed my walk here up Underhill because fewer cars means fewer honking. Uh, less fun. Uh, I'm a fan of the big shiny principles on your early slide. Uh, the streets, I, you know, I'm a believer that streets are for people and that we should focus on how they should get around, not just private vehicles. And I encourage the bold changes that you propose um, with the you know right metrics. I know level of service is sometimes used just for cars, and I, I want to just encourage like the right uh, think about what metrics are being involved. Um, my question is, with all this outreach and everything, what can you do to prevent the best laid plans from being halted at the 11th hour by, I don't know, individuals in City Hall? <laughs> I think you probably can't answer that last question. <laughs> I'm just, I'm asking now. Um, hi, my name is Joseph. I've been here for 12 years. I congratulate you on the outreach. I'm not having a major holiday this year. That's a great change from last year. Uh, why I'm here. Uh, we also all know that Underhill, you know, did happen under the precipice of some ideas that weren't necessarily true, like how dangerous it was. You said that yourself. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. So we know that there are some design plans that are what you want, or what the city wants, what someone wants already, and it's presented to the community that happens everywhere, it happened in Luanas, and I can't help but notice that at the top, of where the open streets are, is where all the high density new real estate is going to be. Mm -hmm. I can't help but notice that, I can't help but notice that, who's here, will ask me on Twitter when I ask her questions, but she's a good neighbor, that makes a placard, but doesn't bother to explain the connection. All I'm saying oh. is the transparency that we keep asking you for, how can you guarantee that lobbyists like real estate lobbyists or transalt lobbyists are not speaking louder than the actual community members? Yeah. 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 We all know how the street works just fine. <laughs> CB6 Transportation Committee member. Um, I kind of do want to like go into the person that was standing in front of me, like because like I've seen these processes go a lot of times, and we've seen the administration has kind of been pulling back from really bigger ideas, and like I have friends in Greenpoint, and the whole saga of McGinnis has been like a mess, and they have the current plan that they have, which was changed in the last minute, is like both sides of people are pretty unhappy with it in current form. So exactly like how can you speak to what the administration, which at the end of the day, the administration has opinions like everyone else, will impact the actual final plan that gets happened. Like, what are you doing to kind of like, you know, deal with the reality that there is a, a bias inherently because government is deciding what they're gonna do when we had you bring us out here and have this whole long process, which may or may not matter at the end of the day. Yeah. 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 What I would say is that this is a community engagement process that the DOT is working with, 
and we're getting your feedback, and that is what's going to guide our actions as we extend it to get into the presentation. So, thanks. Hi, my name is Sharon Kenny. I'm on Eastern Parkway between Washington and Underhill, and I've been there for 50 plus years. And I have seen this neighborhood change drastically, and it seems as though every community that you all do these designs in, you uproot the community and you cause chaos. There is a, there's lawlessness in every city in this country. The sidewalks are for pedestrians, the, the, the vehicular traffic, the streets, and the bike lanes are for the bikers. The parks for everyone. If everyone would obey the law, there would be no reason to change and redesign Underhill, I'm still scratching my head off. The gentleman who designed that couldn't even explain his design. Do you all ever incorporate the community, or if not the community, the community board members when you redesign our neighborhoods? Yeah, it's trans out only. It's only for trans out. We went, uh, there was a slide that talked about a community engagement on Vanderbilt and Underhill. I've been to many of them myself, so to say we did nothing, it's not true. But again, we, since I said to Mr. Jones earlier tonight, there was obviously some holes in what people thought we did in that process, and that's one of the things I'm going to try to improve on moving forward with this process to make up for that. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Dan. I lived in this neighborhood for seven years at uh, Franklin and Sterling. And then I met my now fiance, we moved in together, I moved out of the neighborhood. And my question is, when processes take this long, like you started, you guys started this in 2022, and it's been two years now, and coming up on it's gonna be three by the time we even continue the community outreach process. And like people move in and out in that time frame. Like, how can you have a representative process when building this is going to take us longer than we live in? I would just say um, we we reach out to the community as this when we're doing it. At the time, I can't say who's going. To, no, you know, people can project, but nobody can say like who's going to be here in twenty thirty five. Nobody, you know, we can't project, but nobody else. So. We're going to do the outreach and community engagement with the community that's here and get their feedback. And not only here, like I said, GAP has a lot of impacts for more than just the people or neighbors around. And we'll get that feedback, talk to them, and then move forward from there. That's what we're planning on doing. Hi, my name is Karen McMullen. I've lived in the neighborhood for 30 years. I've lived on Underhill for 20 years. And I just, I live in the middle of the block. So where this, the, the bow comes out, where there's no uh, parking uh, across the street from the two planters. And I'll tell you the three things that I've observed from my window. If someone stops momentarily to load in a baby, lots of my neighbors have young children, to load a baby into a car, um, it blocks the traffic. So the people behind there are either honking, I don't know whoever walked up here and had a nice honk-free uh, walk, but if you live in the house, you walk on, okay, to get around that, they will do two things, go around into the other side of traffic, into oncoming traffic, which doesn't seem particularly safe, and what I've observed recently with delivery trucks, and there are a lot, because we all want our Amazon, is to avoid blocking the traffic, they will park two tires onto the sidewalk. So you have half a truck on a sidewalk where it's a major thoroughfare to the PS9 in the, the park, or you have this honking. And I just want to know if anybody has done an on-the-ground study of what is actually happening after this uh, design. What happens when you put planters in the middle of the street? So that's incredibly um, uh, really great feedback. Um, we will be doing an after analysis of, of Underhill Avenue, so we'll keep everyone posted. And um, as that information um, is uh, collected, that's something we can also share at these outreach and engagement sessions. 
Hi, my name is Phil. Um, I want to just quickly challenge the idea that these streets work as is now, especially when uh, comments like that follow the uh, follow or followed by uh, that they frequently uh, almost hit bicyclists on, on their way in Grand Rue Plaza. I think that's why uh, Capital Improvement Project is particularly uh, relevant here, where uh, and likewise when we talk about enforcement, having actual concrete and streetscape changes that reduce all those conflict points. That it doesn't require necessarily education or people doing uh, the right thing always doesn't necessarily lead to them being injured or killed. Um, I also want to quickly uh, ask about the concept of the traffic study and kind of uh, it, one piece of it is just how cars move through it, but another piece is how people move through it and what kind of metrics you track in, in terms of net people when it comes to pedestrians. We've, we've heard a lot about these pedestrian islands where you see dozens of people queuing up while a handful of single occupancy vehicles kind of pass through, um, the time it takes to cross uh, from those islands, so just the net effect of, of people and on, on pedestrian, cyclists, and vehicles rather than just vehicles moving through the city. Thank you. Uh, just to talk to your final point, I think, yes, we do um, do a bit of analysis on transportation uh, problem mode, so we don't just focus on public service yeah, vehicles, we do um, analyze how much time people are getting across. Are they able to cross in one go? So to the island issue, could you just cross all the way? And that'd be fine. Like, then you don't have to accommodate people queuing on an island. Uh, so there are all of those factors that we can study as part of our work. We'll be sharing. Okay, so my name is Mark. I've lived in the neighborhood for almost 46 years. And I just can't see why something that's broke has to be fixed. If you, if you, if you, now let me continue. Let me continue. That's right. I've given people a turn. Anyone wants to speak in front of me, can. Well, can everybody stop raising your voices to me? What I'm saying is, for almost 46 years I've lived here, a lot of these plans, taking vehicles, that are moving okay through the Grand Army Plaza and putting them onto the local residential streets is an attorney of local streets into what Berkeley Place has become, which is like an on-ramp for the Cross Bronx Expressway and a real air pollution trap. You know, all the people here, a lot of you people, you know, claim to be so green, yet this is the most anti-green thing imaginable. Now, I'd like to know, I'd like to know what this Flatbush uh, bus plan is. Is that going to take cars off of Flatbush Avenue and put them onto the side streets? Is that what it means? Yeah, so repeat what I said earlier. There is no final plan yet, and we haven't even gone to public next. So well, what's it mean? Yeah. We're looking at bus priority on Flatbush. We started a process over a year ago to look at bus priority for the B41 along Flatbush Avenue, and it's still a little virus to do that. When we have something to talk about, we will come to But this does that mean street. taking private cars? It doesn't, mean anything, it doesn't mean anything until we have a plan. We don't have a plan. Well, I see, so it doesn't mean anything. Yeah. Nothing we can do. I'm more than <laughs> Uh, uh, that seemed like a hard job, I don't have any. Anyway, uh, I was going to say, uh, I was going to bring up the same thing about the Grand Army Plaza Triangle that a lot of other people uh, seem to agree with, so I'll skip that. Um, but I think to go back again to safety, to go back again to like metrics on how you're studying like traffic patterns and like effectiveness and things like that, I would like to encourage you to really take the whole picture into account, so not, like you said, like, Cars moving through, pedestrians moving through, bicycles moving through. Also, in just to zoom out a little bit, I think like things are changing. Right? So like what I think like not just uh, just trends in like maybe New York City, but just across America, just like cars are getting bigger, right? Like bikes are getting faster. Like there are things that are changing about the way that we use these things that we have throughout like for like you know, forever. That like I don't know. Like we have to think about how we design our cities. To So I work for the Berkeley Public Library for the Capital Project Facilities team. So thanks to the library for hosting this. <laughs> Thank you. I worked at DPC. I managed Capital uh, CPSD studies over there for the for the public building size, but I would like to give infrastructure some benefit of the doubt. I generally find that who we hire to design these projects have an intellectual disconnect. So many of you yes. Unfortunately, people that say they are based in New York City, but they do not necessarily live in some of these yes. neighborhoods, 
And unfortunately, the demographic of some of these people that we hire are also very skewed to the people who they are trying to do. Yes. Yes. So public building, I don't know about infrastructure, DOT, I'll let you do your thing. But I will, I also, I live in downtown Brooklyn in an affordable housing unit that I kind of have to live in because the city is not affordable. And I take that forty one bus every day. And sometimes it takes 35 minutes to go from here to Junior's Cheesecake, which yeah. is so ridiculous. Like, there should be no reason why I take a bus, because I like to stay above the grade, to get to and from work every single day. So I really hope that, although it would be great to increase the bus traffic on Black Avenue, that it doesn't get pushed to where people are actually living. what everyone has already said, um, just in an effort to be solution oriented. Like I'm a pedestrian and you know a driver. I drive regularly, but I walk to work every day. But when I do have to drive and we do have to look for parking, there's alternate side that we don't have a choice. We have to move the cars even if we're not moving them that day. The planters and the rocks in the middle of the street have become an issue. I'm just wondering, if, has there been an effort maybe to look out to the local um, parking garages and ask if maybe they would be willing to like accept some sort of voucher or something so that the people in the neighborhood, maybe some of the cars can get off the street so we can get into the parking lots and maybe that would free up some space? Because it's just so many parking spaces have been taken away, but there's been no effort to like it, the solution seems to be well, get rid of your car, everyone, and that's just not reality for everyone. Some people need a car for work or for accessibility purposes. We have not approached the garage or anybody for that. Um, I don't even, um, to be honest, I don't even know how that will work. It have probably have to be some. I don't know how that will work. But um, we do acknowledge again. Yes, there's been a lot of uh, car ownership has grown, grown up a lot, both registered car ownership and unregistered in New York City since the pandemic, particularly, has accelerated. So there has been, you know, obviously we know park is a big issue, and that's something that will be talked about as we begin the community engagement process. Good evening, my name is Joe. I am a cyclist and a taxpayer. And uh, <laughs> from transportation, uh, you people need to stop with Pablo rallies. Yeah. You're in the business to make, you're the business of transportation, not to make provinces where, where, uh, where people can drive or not. And also, uh, the open streets, they're terrible. They, they cause congestion everywhere else. Yeah. And, and also, they're not properly maintained. I've seen them myself. The, the, I've been to one, the Newport <clears throat> Avenue you mentioned. One, one side of the street, there's like cracks everywhere. And then the, the other side of the street is like, oh, there's like nice little paint and there's uh, little, those, plant, those uh, rocks and those planters. And uh, and also, you, you're not being accountable for all the tax dollars that's going into this stuff. I mean, yes. what, it's like $400 million in these public realms? They do that a couple of years. They don't want they brought. They don't, they don't want chaos. That's why you have more of these ludicrous uh, workshops. How long is this, how long is this gonna go on? It's, it's, it's really like a, it's really like a dystopian freaking movie or something. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> that's all I want. There's a lot of money involved. <laughs> oh yeah, I forgot. Uh, Mark Horton is uh, the guy from Moment Plants. He's, he's uh, responsible. The that's his uh, propaganda rider there from Street Squad. Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm from Street Squad. That's right. Say hi, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Say hi, Dave. You have no, 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 you have no integrity at all. I'm not a journalist. I'm living in Rockford Heights uh, here on Carter Avenue for the past 35 name. years. I'm a car owner. I'm a pedestrian and I use the soccer. I look at all these plans and I never ever hear about building a public, public drive-in, drive-out garage <laughs> where are the, the businesses would give the, the shoppers one hour free parking. So you would go in, take your tickets, and you get an hour to go and shop, and you don't have to pay. If you stay longer than you pay. Uh, and also, it could be long term parking, would remove the cars from the street, and you could have wider streets, you wouldn't have the congestion, because I park my, my car on the street as the <laughs> Yo, look at she pushing. That's transit right there. She's on the clock. 
Like, yo, she's on the clock. Yeah, like, you're on the, come on, she's on the clock. That's a transult. You scan the link. It's transult. The current situation that we have in terms of on street parking is that we all know it's free for everybody, which is something that I think we've taken, we've gotten used to for the years. But also, the current parking system favors people who work nine to five, favors people who work from home. Um, but some of us don't, and some of us don't have that schedule. I am a first responder, and I come home at two o'clock in the morning, and there's never any parking. And I can go to Vanderbilt Avenue and park, but I have to move my car at 7 a.m. So when you think about parking, maybe you might want to think about some of the users of parking um, and how we can maybe redesign the parking that we do have to make it more equitable for people. Question? Yep. <laughs> um, any other questions from the audience? We have about four more minutes. Yeah, one more. I gotta ask a question. Yeah, yeah, uh, no, no, no. Oh, yeah. Yeah, come on. I'm gonna ask a question. Can you go back to the slide on that? Uh, the Dave Cologne, like blowing. <laughs> Dave Cologne, come on. Plaza Street, East and West, and Vanderbilt Plaza. There's that clown? There's no I know, mention right? And there's, those are probably the streets that get most impacted by any change you do to Grand Rapids Plaza. And I'm just here to suggest that, that they are right for open streets. They, they are right for an open street. They, they carry the only local traffic. They don't need to be used That's by people. They don't need to be used by other vehicles. That's so true. And, and right now, you talk about the school. Berkeley Carroll double parks their cars on Plaza Street West every day at from two to three o'clock and completely blocks the, the street to any car. Everybody has to go through the bike lane. But I yep. want you to consider that open streets on Plaza Street. You mean closed streets? Yeah. So just to the question about Plaza Street, we are going to go for a four minute process. It's not shown here because yeah, it's not. Four minutes um, left, guys. Four point six. Uh, larger scale changes, but it is included in the study, and if you have suggestions, we do take those into account because it, it is included in the, this, the larger study. Yeah. Um, I'm 91 and walk slowly with a cane, and yet I can walk across and around Grand Army Plaza and do all the time. And I also drive and, and drive around fairly easily. Uh, I moved to Brooklyn 50 years ago to the corner of the Butler and Sterling, when this place was a mess, and it's much better now. And I've been living in the corner of uh, Vanderbilt and Plaza for more than 30 years, and uh, I, I like it the way it is, and I hope it doesn't get worse. I think you've done a great job so far. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, one last one from some of you. All right, cool. Hi, guys. Um, Cheryl Smith. Um, my son, who's not an analyst uh, on, on traffic, made a simple suggestion of couldn't Underhill have just become a one-way street without ending it at Atlantic, or and then you wouldn't have had to narrow, you wouldn't have had to do the, you could have just put the bike things down, and because it's almost crazy to, to change directions two times on a simple yes. Yes. street that was always quiet. I've been over there 18 years, and I've lived in Crown Heights, for longer than that, and I don't see how a quiet street now has honking, and also it's uh, you've created you're with art. If you're going to choke off these arteries, you know, uh, from Barclay to Van Washington becomes uh, uh, impossible to travel certain times of day, and so when you do that to that little street, it also creates a lot of backup on other streets, along with what happens open streets. I understand the open streets during the pandemic. We need the people to get together to convalesce them, you know. But do we need it now? Is all I'm saying. Isn't that wide nope. enough that they can, the restaurants can have the whole sidewalks? The street is passable. 
the, the little joke of who's just trying to get home from work and take the bus without being rerouted to God knows where. I'm just saying, I think there were many more ways it could have been handled. Yeah, it's welfare for restaurants, too. <laughs> welfare space for restaurants. Man. Yeah, thank you all for coming out. We appreciate you taking your time. I guess next steps will be when you return to the various community boards, if not another person. <laughs> yeah. I got your video, don't worry about it. Oh, Betty right here. Yeah. See, she's pushing trans. Yeah. Yeah. This is nothing but trans all right here. That's a trans all. Like, she's on the clock. Again, transportation alternatives. She's on the clock. Influencing the DOD's policies. Yeah, she's on the clock. They just won't quit. Yeah, you know? You know? And watch her go up there and take a photo. It a RICO investigation. Yeah. Watch her go there and try to take a photo yeah. with, uh, with with the DOT people. Like, this is RICO crazy. Investigation. Like, you pushing the agenda. That would be cool, wouldn't it? Mm hmm Like, Davey right there, and you had a guy trying to kiss his ass. I'm like, come on, bro. <laughs> yeah, who was that guy with the, the brown hair and shit? What was his deal? He really didn't like you. <laughs> no, I don't. Yeah, guys, I put, I, put I put her on blast. Yeah. And then I put her on, and I, I said, I'll I did like. I, I was excited to ride here. I was oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you missed the, you missed the, yeah. any, nothing patty, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. No, this is the same shit they're doing in Jamaica too. But oh yeah. It's 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 less extreme than this though. Yeah. yeah because they know everybody just they can't afford, they can't enforce that shit. They, they, mm -hmm. they, they won't fuck with the people in South Wales. Yeah. Around she, here, she around here is still tons of gender fires and yeah. uh, transportation alternatives. Still I mean, has, uh, like, come on, that's what me asking. If, I get, if you admit to me that you're on the clock, I'll give, I'll give you a shirt back. Kathy, if you Kathy, if you admit to me that you're on the clock, I'll give you I'll give you a shirt back. If you admit to me that you're on the clock right now, I'll give you a shirt back. Or right now. Are you on the clock? Are you on the clock? Yeah, That's what you're on the clock. Come on. So you're on the clock. She is on the clock. This guy decided to form a public realm around her. Yeah, she's on the clock. Like, come on, man. This is a shirt. She's, this is a shirt she complained about. Tavon Fisher. Take it off. Go. Take it off. Right, she's just going to appreciate the, just gonna appreciate yeah. the uh, your, your homage to, to, to this to, lobby. To the lobby, to the bike lobby. Ever, ever bike lobby. <laughs> this guy makes me sick. Yeah, Dave Cologne. He's like, they yeah, right here, right here. He's sarcastic. He knows what he's doing. Yeah. It's just strange. Yeah, it's a joke. This whole thing with jokes. Was they don't want right now? Supposed to kick us out, but we're still here. We're we'll, probably out of here, huh? Yeah, I got, I got. Let's throw a camera for you in the case. I got, I got, I got like enough battery power. Don't worry about it. But they know what they're doing. You know what I mean? They know what they're doing. You got Kathy here. They've been doing this since the pandemic. They've been exploring the pandemic. Uh, the last, the thing, they want the pandemic. That was, you know, some other guy, that older guy, yeah. the guys just put this. Like, you know, they, I told you, they explained the pandemic. They, they, they want the pandemic to continue. And he made an observation about one of the guys here that was for this nonsense. How he was like, still wearing, he's like wearing a mask. What, 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 what yeah. are you wearing a mask for? Yeah. We're crying out loud. Mm hmm. I think when people are still wearing masks in 2024. I mean, I bet you'll take an Uber. I bet she's gonna take. I don't think she bought that. Oh, that, yeah. that, that, that cargo. That pink, she didn't bring that. that. She didn't bring. Yeah, she didn't bring that. that yeah, I, I don't think she bought an Uber. Hey, but she's she, she's saying like, oh, we're not anti car. But I you wrote here from Liberty Avenue. I, I was making that was. I was making, oh, we I say make sure you take you take the train tonight. No, I wrote from East New York. Oh, by the way, through Brown, through Ocean Hill and Brownsville, that right, take, up to Eastern Parkway. I wrote. All right, be safe out there. Thanks. So. I wrote. It took me like forty minutes. I got here, what, six, actually, it took me 30 minutes. Yeah. Also, I got delayed because they're having a fashion show on uh, yeah, the yeah. museum, and there was, uh, like, a big realm around it. Yeah. Big public realm of barricades and shit. Yeah. Mess. Why don't I got that? See, you so, so like a uh, fake protest. Yeah, so, by the way, she yeah, she got mad about this shirt. Take it off. <laughs> Before you got here. Take it off. Wow. Before you got here, I said, I'll take it off. You admit you're on the clock. Me, I'll give you your shirt back. All right, all right. All right. You're on the clock. <laughs> I can't believe she made, a, she made arts and crafts She know that she know to put TA on that crap. Why tax dollars pay for that? Yeah. <laughs>
company that does the transport, the transportation alternatives group, and there's the Department of Transportation Alternatives and Communities. Uh, mm -hmm. Everybody's coalesced here at the uh, Bay Arts and Crafts there. Yeah. Nice. I know, Cindy Bring on Plaza. I almost, uh, trying to cross the street here, I almost got hit by three e bikers. <laughs> mm -hmm. So. That's another thing. How do you get to tame the e bikes? I mean, how do you get to tame all the e bike rides? How do you get to tame bo yeah. How do you get to tame the, the, the DoorDash and shit, the, the Uber Eats? Yeah. Because they're everywhere. Mm -hmm. and, and of course, the city bike motorcycles, those people don't stop at all. Yeah, they don't. They never stop. <laughs> and what are they going to do with the cars? Because cars are never going away. Never. Yeah, yeah. You want to know how cars are never going away? Because look at all the new development that's gone on here. Mm -hmm. Look at new development. People, those, those apartments are going for what? $3,000, 4000 $5,000 a month? You think yeah. those people renting with that money, that can afford that money, are going to buy bikes? You yeah. They can, no. Yeah, they cologne here. And they're building garages in those buildings. Yeah. They're still building the garages. <laughs> He on, he's on camera right here. Why do you have your press pass, Dave? Dave, why do you have your press pass? Why do you have your press pass? Dave, why do you have your press pass? Why do you have your press pass, Dave? Dave, why do you have your press pass? I know he's from Streetbox, so... Yeah, Streetbox is fake, it's fake, it's yellow, ner yellow news. It's yellow news. Yellow journalism. It's yellow journalism. Let her have a conversation. Yeah, all right. You're doing an interview? That's an interview, right? Yeah. That's an interview. Yeah, that's an interview. Let it, let it do it. Yeah, 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 no problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's an interview. Yeah, yellow journalist. Okay, no problem. No problem. That's an interview. So if you can just maybe. She looks like a. Are you an urbanist, like a, like a like an expert or some shit like that? Sorry, what's that? Are you like an expert urbanist or? Uh, no, I'm just a local person oh, you're a local. who works here. Oh. Who every day cycles. Oh. Yeah. Oh really? I, I cycle too. It's excellent. Yeah, I cycle too. You know what? You know how so I got here? So yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I wrote East New York. <laughs> no bike lanes at all. Yeah, I moved from East New York. No bike lanes. Yeah. East and Park Lane, no bike lanes. <laughs> Liberty Avenue, no bike lanes. I ride these seats every no day. No press pass on, guys. No press pass on. That's I right. Call. He's here at Crystal Pass. First look at Pass, even my trans off shirt on. So I dare to come on. I'm here uh, re exercising uh, First Amendment activities. Right. Yeah. <laughs> What up, Kathy? <laughs> Kathy, excuse me, Kathy? Oh, Kathy, come on. Come on, Kathy. Kathy, you're a lobbyist. Kathy, you you're a lobbyist, Kathy. Kathy, you're a lobbyist. Kathy. You're a lobbyist, Kathy. She will never answer my question. How yeah, she won't. And she's look up, like look at this. Yeah. Like, what's that? What's that? Sorry about that. JQ, JQ, come. JQ, look, 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 look at this. The DOT is going to try to take a photo with Kathy, who owns the DOT. You own the DOT, Kathy. You own the DOT. You own the DOT. Everybody know you do. You own the DOT. No, you're not. You fight for trans all. You fight for the special interests. Fighting for the lobbyists. That's what you're fighting for, Kathy. You're fighting for the lobbyists. <laughs> fighting for the lobbyists. Fight for Mark Gorton, who pays your salary. Yeah, Kathy, you're fighting for the lobbyists. Lobbyists. Kathy's a lobbyist. She works for Transall. You work for Transalt. Kathy worked for Transalt. Yeah, Kathy worked for Transalt. Can you please not stop? I'm not, yes. You, yes. You're a cat. You work for Transalt. You work for Transalt. It's a, <laughs> no, nobody's harassing you. Nobody's harassed. Nobody's harassing you. You're a lobbyist. We pay your salary. We pay your salary. You're a citizen. Yeah, yeah, you're not. Yeah, we pay your salary. Yeah. Yeah. 
actually, she's no, she's actually running. She's actually evading accountability. Yeah, yeah. We pay her. We pay her salary. We don't care. We we pay her sal. We pay her salary. She enables a stalker. You know that, right? She enables Kev um, Kevin Lachera. You know that, right? Kevin Lachera stalks seven women. You don't. You know that, right? She stalks seven women. She she protecting the guy. Come on, man. You get mad with I come on. Kevin stalks seven women, and you're she protecting the guy. But you get mad what we doing? Come on, man. I'm not in a lawsuit. Kevin is. And that's a trans old thing that she bought here. Like, come on, like. Yeah. Can you guys just do me a favor? We have to start moving. Yeah, we have. We have. Let's go. Let's go. Let's bounce. Yeah, 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 yeah. We got. We got. We got. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Yeah, they can't. Like, Kevin stalks seven women. Like, come on. Oh, let's get out Let's respect. Let's respect these people here. Because she's out there right there, bro. She's out in the hallway, bro. No, we don't win the hallway. Yeah, yeah, let's go, let's go. If we want to, we want to talk about, you know, there she go. Yeah, protecting that. Yeah. A quick, a quick question. But she protecting that stalker, Kevin Latera. Yeah, I know. Right? That's uh, that's ridiculous. I mean, yeah. I don't know why she's so afraid of cell phones. She's she, yeah. She loves she the camera. Fake, she does fake protests all the time. Yeah, Kathy protects stalkers. She protects Kevin Lachera. The transportation Alternatives has their own media, too, to, to produce their shit. Yeah. <laughs> she's yeah, she's going she to take that photo, taking an Uber home. <laughs> and there's taking an Uber. Stop protecting stalkers, Kathy. Yeah, really? Stop protecting Kevin. You, Stop Dave. protecting Kevin. See you, Dave. See you, Dave. See you, Dave. No, you're not. No, you're not. You, you're Dave Cologne, bro. You are Dave Cologne. about to take an Uber home. Man. Not Yellow right. journalism. <laughs> you, should, you should really rescind your past pre press pass. They should take away from you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, My God. What a yeah. Place. Yeah. Yeah. Well, came by. Yeah. I came by. Wasn't yeah. that hard to get here? Nope. Yeah. Oh, 40 minutes. I got I to gotta go to Target, so <laughs> it doesn't matter. I got to go to Target. They have a fashion show up the back. Yeah, I'm not going that shit. Yeah, I got yeah, it. But I, I, I kick in because I don't have press pass. So. Yeah, yeah, I ain't yeah, going. They got, they got that. They got that down. Yeah. You see how? You see how she was trying to take a photo with DOT and I shut the, I shut that shit down. Yeah, of course. That's why she got mad. I'm like, I'm not gonna like, take no photo with DOT. <laughs> shut that shit right down. I know you'll take photo with DOT, yeah. but it's all good, yo. So like I said, I'm gonna make sure I gotta go to Target get some get some food. But it's all good. Life is good. Y'all see KQL well here. I gotta upload this video later on tonight. Yeah. <laughs> Riding with a helmet on. Safe for Grand Army Plaza. On the sidewalk. Feel safe already. Yeah, so yeah. <laughs> cars doing that. Yeah. <laughs> so you know what it is? You, your bike, you took the bike here, right? Yeah, it's there. Oh, by the, bike, by the bike dock. So yeah, I'm about to head home and shit. So yeah, yeah take care, bro. Yo, it's all good. Got it here. No press pass. Like I said, she got mad that I couldn't, she could take the photo with you. I, could, I shut that shit down. So it's what it is, guys. God bless DOT. You know, it's all good. It's America do what I want. She just upset. I shut the whole thing down tonight. So, it's what it is. One day in the fight against Transportation Alternatives 2024. So, it's all good, everybody. Take care, everybody. Adios. Later. No to lobbyists. No to special interests. No to trans all. No to um, capital organizations that's ran by Mark Gordon. So, later, everybody. It's what it is. America, God bless you. It's all good. Gotta get, I'm gonna go target some food. Uh, public realm. There's an art show up the block, so I'm not going to that. I got things. I got. I get some food for my house. So later. Happy Monday. Happy the tw happy 15th tax day. So 15th. Happy tax day. Later. Adios.